I'm Kyle Cleveland with Hugh Jay's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. Uh, we're pleased tonight to have Michael Schellenberger speak on nuclear issues. Uh, Michael was named by Time Magazine a Hero of the Environment. He won the Green Award, Book Award winner. Um, he is the founder and president of Environmental Progress, um, a kind of think tank at uh, Berkeley. He's a regular contributor to Forbes, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. Um, I recommend you check out his TED Talks, which are very good. Um, I first came to know Michael through a documentary called Pandora's Promise, which is a pro-nuclear documentary, and he's one of the central figures in that documentary. Um, he is a co-author of visionary books and essays, including the Echo Modernist Manifesto, The Death of Environmentalists, and Breakthrough from the Death of Environmentalism to the Politics of Possibility. Michael's advised policymakers around the world in Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, the Philippines, the United States, Australia, the, the UK, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Um, his research and writing has appeared in the Harvard Law and Policy Review, Democracy Journal, The New Republic, New York Times, Slate, and USA Today. Um, I think we're going to have a very interesting Q&A after this, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing the lecture. So let's welcome Michael. Um, thank you so much, Kyle. Kyle's work, um, he told me not to talk about it, but Kyle's work has been an inspiration um, in a lot of ways, and in fact inspired big parts of the argument that I'm going to make tonight. And, um, and I'm really eager to get your reaction. This is a, a completely new speech. It's actually the most difficult speech I've written ever, um, and you'll probably see why when I start talking. <laughs> so, um, you know, the first thing is, about Fukushima, I've been twice. Uh, one of the most impressive things for me about it is that in contrast to the reputation for face saving, Japan commissioned not one but two independent investigations. Both were led by uh, men of great respect, Kiyoshi Kurakawa um, for the diet and Yoichi Funabashi for Rebuild Japan, both of whom I interviewed. And in their reports, they both faulted not just individual people, but Japanese culture, in particular the culture of key institutions, including TEPCO. Fukushima was, quote, made in Japan, Kurokawa wrote, blaming, quote, our reflexive obedience, our reluctance to question authority, our devotion to sticking with program, our groupism, and our insularity. Multiple failures resulted in the meltdowns, but one in particular has stuck with me, which was the decision by the Fukushima plant manager not to raise the seawall that was protecting Fukushima Daiichi for fear of scaring the local population. So it was the social fear of scaring people that, that contributed directly to the disaster. And I think there's an important lesson there, not just for Japan, but for uh, people involved in nuclear more broadly. But how much danger really was there? Everybody knows that nuclear is dangerous, and yet all of the scientific studies that have been conducted over the last 40 years show that nuclear is already the safest way to make reliable electricity. You can see that the majority of the, the vast majority of the deaths from different forms of energy are from the air pollution. And because nuclear doesn't produce any air or water pollution during its normal operation, it um, ends up being the safest way to make electricity. This is, by the way, all of my sources are listed here at the bottom, and they can all be found on the website environmentalprogress.org. Uh, very easy to find when you visit. And the, the reason, of course, is that regular air pollution kills about 7 million people a year, about 4 million deaths a year from fossil fuel production, both in producing electricity and about uh, three million, and from also uh, transportation, and about three million deaths a year from burning biomass and dung, mostly in poor countries uh, of indoor air pollution. What about Fukushima? This is the best available science collected by the IAEA, the United Nations World Health Organization, and what they find is no radiation-related deaths will occur, but over 2,000 people will die as a result of the evacuation or the stress related to it. In a major report issued by uh, Philip, uh, led by Philip Thomas of Bristol University last year, 
a group of scientists argued that there should not be evacuations during nuclear accidents in the future. They were pulling people out of nursing homes, out of hospitals, that it was the panic and the fear that drove the death toll from the Fukushima accident, not from radiation. Unlikely to be any increase in thyroid cancer from the doses received, psychological harm was caused, and a big economic impact. So one question you might have is, well, come on, is that really right? I mean, maybe there's some sort of a cover-up by scientists. Maybe there's some kind of conspiracy to hide the truth. If there is a conspiracy, it would be an extraordinary effort because there's literally hundreds of scientists have been involved in collecting the data. It would be the kind of conspiracy that climate skeptics imagine is occurring at the United Nations around global warming. It would be a remarkable conspiracy to keep secret for all of these years. What about Chernobyl? Chernobyl is the worst nuclear accident that's ever occurred, almost certainly the worst accident that will ever occur. It was a reactor that had no containment and it caught on fire. Um, during the death, 28 firefighters died from acute radiation syndrome. And as tragic as any death of a firefighter is, it's worth putting that in context. About 80 firefighters died in the United States last year. 343 firefighters died during the September 11th terrorist attacks. And since then, 15 total deaths from thyroid cancers over a 25-year year period. And scientists estimate about, a one per, about uh, um, 16,000 excess thyroid cancers in total with a 1% mortality rate. If you have to get cancer, thyroid cancer is one of the best ones to get because it's so easy to treat. You just remove the thyroid gland and you take a synthetic thyroid substitute. There's really no reason to die from thyroid cancer. The only people that will die from it are people that didn't get the treatment that they needed. So in some senses, it's just a consequence of lack of health care. No effects on fertility, no impact on birth defects. What about, what about these photos that we've seen of kids with birth defects that were born after Chernobyl? Well, it turns out that, that people who have been born with birth defects for as long as humans have been around. Birth defects have always been around. No increase in birth defects after Chernobyl. No increase in any other cancer rates, including in the cohort of the quote unquote liquidators who cleaned up after Chernobyl. You really shouldn't take my word for it. Uh, when I was starting to change my own mind about nuclear, I went and read these reports. And you can see there's the link to it from the UNSEER studies. Um, but obviously, serious consequences from fear of radiation. And the reason that there's just so little harm caused by these accidents is that we're just exposed to much more radiation in other ways. Most of the radiation we get is from radon, which is the decay gas uh, from uranium, uh, but also radiology, x-rays, other medical procedures, absorb a, few, uh, a lot of uh, radiation from soil, cosmic rays, food, and you can see that Chernobyl nuclear plants, bomb tests, produce very low levels of radiation exposure. And this is an interesting study. It shows that actually if you were one of the people that cleaned up Chernobyl, what they call the liquidators, your mortality, your increased mortality was about 1%, but if you live with a smoker, it was 1.7 times that, and if you live in a big city like Tokyo and breathe the air, 2.8 times greater risk than being a Chernobyl liquidator. What about wind and solar? These are safe sources of energy, we're told. How many people are aware of this wind accident that occurred in the Netherlands? Um, one person? That's awesome. We have to talk after this, because I have no idea how you heard about this. Uh, we just discovered this in the Netherlands. A video was done uh, of these two uh, mechanics who got caught in a, in a turbine fire at the top of this wind turbine. This is a video that was shot where they embraced right before one of them jumped to his death and the other one was engulfed in flames. Sometimes people say, well, the reason we pay attention to nuclear accidents is because they're so spectacular. But there was, there's never been, I mean, Fukushima certainly never had anything quite as spectacular as this, and yet we never, I mean, most of us have never seen this image before or knew about this accident. Um, the a database has been collected of all the wind deaths that's ever occurred, and, the, and we verified all of them in our organization, and the wind deaths are uh, more wind deaths per unit of energy than from nuclear power. As a consequence, 
what nuclear has done is actually saved almost two million lives to date, according to a study done by my friend, the climate scientist, James Hansen. The reason is because if you're using nuclear energy for your electricity, you're not burning fossil fuels, and as, as you recall, those fossil fuels kill about four million people every year. I'm from the state of Colorado. Um, it turns out that radiation levels in Colorado are higher than in most of Fukushima after the Fukushima accident. The reason is because we have a lot of uranium in the granite rock in Colorado. And mortality rates in Colorado are actually lower than, the, cancer and mortality rates are lower than they are in much of the rest of the United States. Probably for reasons that don't have anything to do with radiation, the latest hypothesis is that it's the lower levels of oxygen um, that are, a con that are uh, maybe driving lower rates of mortality. So one of the questions is, if nuclear is so safe, why are we so afraid of it? And this is a, a complex question. Whenever I travel, people ask me, is nuclear safe? What do you do with the waste? And why are people so afraid of it? The first two questions are relatively straightforward to answer. We have a lot of scientific information on them. But the third one, why are we so afraid of it, is much more mysterious and interesting, and it will be the focus of my talk tonight. So one of the responses is just that people don't know the facts about nuclear and about radiation. And that's no doubt true. The question is, why don't we know the facts about radiation? So one possibility is that the news media have failed in their responsibility or that nobody has done the work of informing the news media about nuclear power and radiation. But the truth is, is that just a few weeks after Fukushima, the British radiation expert, Dr. Geraldine Thomas from Imperial College London spoke at a packed press conference in Tokyo where journalists asked her point blank, how many people did she think would die from the radiation from Fukushima, and she said zero people will die. Zero. She told all the journalists there, she spent time with them. Her credibility is unsurpassed. She's the founder of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. She literally collects the tissue samples from people's thyroids from Chernobyl. She said zero people will die, and yet I, 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 I don't think that there's many people that you would interview in Japan that would have heard that or agree with that. So maybe the problem is that we don't believe people like, we don't believe the experts. We don't trust the experts um, when it comes to issues like radiation. We're just really scared of radiation. But I'll tell you a story. When my son was uh, under two years old, he got very sick. I live in Berkeley, California. And we took him to the hospital, and the doctor said, well, we don't know what's going on with him, so what we want you to do is have him drink this radioactive liquid, which is called barium, and then we're gonna put them under an x-ray machine. And at the time, I was very anti-nuclear and very radiophobic, so I said, I, that sounds kinda crazy. You want me to give my, my baby radioactive liquid and put them under an x-ray machine? Is that safe? And the doctor said, yeah, that's safe to do because the radiation levels are so low. And so we said, okay, and we did it. So we, we accepted the expert advice on radiation in the hospital, as most people do, but we don't believe the experts when they tell us that Chernobyl will kill a maximum of 200 people and that Fukushima radiation will kill zero. So why is it? Why don't we trust the experts in one context but do trust them in another? And if we believe that the news media have failed in their duty to inform the public, and I think I do, I think there's no question that they have. We certainly see people that refuse to give their children vaccines. We were told that we know that vaccines are safe. The news media reported as a fact. It's not like covered as a debate in the way that nuclear safety is covered as an issue of debate. Vaccines are viewed as just something safe. So we inject our children with polio virus and measles virus and other viruses. They're weakened versions of the main viruses, but we inject our children with those viruses. Why? We're told by the experts and the media that, that they're safe and it's better for our kids to inject them with vaccines. But yet the issue of nuclear and radiation is considered a controversy, even though really there's not any controversy among radiation experts that low levels of radiation are harmless. So clearly there's some 
responsibility, some failure on the part of the news media, but that just raises another question. Why is the news media failing to properly inform the public on nuclear plant accidents and radiation and succeeding in other areas? We have to take a closer look at some of the history. When I was 12 years old, ABC TV promoted a movie called The Day After that they encouraged parents to watch with their children. And it was a movie about nuclear war and the aftermath of nuclear war. And I begged my parents to let me watch it because I was becoming political and a left-wing kid and I wanted to see this incredible TV show. And it was absolutely terrifying. It showed kids being uh, bombed and killed in their classrooms, scenes of mothers holding their children and being eviscerated. Um, kids dying. I've had nightmares about nuclear war ever since I saw this television show. To this day, I still have nightmares of, of nuclear war. And I think there's really little question that the existence of nuclear weapons disturbs almost everybody when you think about it for a moment. The idea that there are weapons that exist that could kill billions of people creates an underlying anxiety or what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when there's a contradiction between your underlying beliefs and the reality of the world. And the way that that cognitive dissonance forms on nuclear weapons is that most of us, if we're not depressed, we get out of bed in the morning with some idea that we're gonna live a productive life, that the world is a place that we can live in, and the existence of these horrible weapons and the possibility there could be a nuclear war is really difficult to deal with. And what the historians of the nuclear age find is that after real world events, say North Korea testing weapons over Japan or Reagan's rhetoric in the 80s, after that generates a lot of scary uh, news media coverage that the public then kind of goes to sleep and we put it out of our minds. And, and why not? I mean, it's very depressing to think about such horrible events that you can do nothing about. And so I think the normal response is just to put it out of your mind. It's a kind of, it's a form of denial as a coping mechanism. But we also find that um, other people try to resolve the cognitive dissonance. And you can resolve the cognitive dissonance either by changing your beliefs or by trying to change the world, trying to change reality. And what we find is that liberals and conservatives try to resolve the cognitive dissonance by changing the world in different ways. And I'm, I'm really gonna speak to liberals and conservatives in the United States and to a lesser extent, or to some extent as well in Russia or the earlier Soviet Union. Um, the way that conservatives tried to resolve the cognitive dissonance from the existence of nuclear weapons was to treat nuclear weapons like normal weapons. And so what that meant was conservatives attempted to, to achieve dominance in nuclear weapons. So you saw a big drive to get more and more weapons um, on the part of the United States and the Soviet Union. And if you look at bar charts of, who, of, of nuclear weapons globally, you'll see that there's just these huge amounts of nuclear weapons in the United States and the Soviet Union, and every other country has small amounts of nuclear weapons. And what was going on in the United States and the Soviet Union was that we were trying to build big enough arsenals to take out the other guy's nuclear weapons in an idea that a nuclear war, that you could win a nuclear war. So that was the way that the political right dealt with the anxiety created by nuclear weapons in the 1950s. The way that liberals dealt with nuclear weapons was to imagine that we could get rid of them. And so we had a, a, a nuclear prohibition movement, it still exists, um, that argued that we could get rid of nuclear weapons if we worked hard enough and tried hard enough. And there's been that movement has, has been attempting to do that for 75 years. But there was a problem right away with the idea that we could get rid of nuclear weapons. There was two problems. And they were both identified in late 1945 by a study group at Yale University. They said there's two problems. The first is that it's incredibly difficult, it'd be incredibly difficult to enforce any abolition or prohibition of nuclear weapons why? Because they're so small. You know, you can get a warhead that big, and you can hide them under a, a, a water well, under a well of water, where the water would basically shield the radiation and couldn't be detected. So almost impossible to enforce 
any prohibition on a ban of uh, on a prohibition of nuclear weapons just for technological reasons. But there's a second problem, and I think it was more important and and more salient, which was that what they realized that if, if two countries, let's say the United States and the Soviet Union, the United States and Russia, both got rid of their nuclear weapons and then went to war, the first thing that they would do would be to reconstruct their nuclear weapons and then use them on the other side in order to win that war. And so that in, in retrospect, they realized that it would be worse to get rid of the weapons, recreate them and use them than to continue with a, a, a policy of, of deterrence where both sides would have, a, have an interest in not using the weapons. Nonetheless, uh, progressives attempted to get rid of weapons for you know, several decades until you got to around the early 70s, early to late 70s, and you started to see the anti-nuclear weapons movement shift their focus to trying to get rid of nuclear power plants. A friend of mine who was a leader in the anti-nuclear weapons and the anti-nuclear energy movement came and saw me recently. He, he's changed his mind as well about nuclear energy, he believes that we need it to deal with climate change. And he told me the story about how they made this decision as anti-nuclear weapons advocates to get rid of nuclear energy. And I asked him, I said, well, how, I said, what was the, what was the thinking? Like, like, how did you imagine that getting rid of nuclear power plants would get rid of nuclear weapons. And he got kind of a blank look on his face. He got kind of quiet and he goes, I don't know. We didn't really think about it. And so what was really going on wasn't like a, a real world logic or a political logic. It was a psychologic. It was a psychological uh, construct, which psychologists call displacement. Displacement comes from Freud. It, interpretation of dreams, but it's a very simple idea. The idea of displacement is that our negative emotions directed at a, at a powerful object that we can't get rid of, in this case weapons, is displaced and redirected onto a weaker object like nuclear plants. I can't get rid of nuclear weapons, but I could try to stop them from building a nuclear power plant near my home. And that's what we saw in the 1970s. The United States was, had plans to get about 50% of our electricity from nuclear power. Instead, we ended up doing about, getting about 20% of our electricity from nuclear power. The, one of the most uh, easy ways to understand displacement is as scapegoating. So for example, you know, your boss yells at you at work. Well, you can't yell at your boss, but yet you feel all this terrible anxiety. So you go home and yell at your spouse. Or, you're, or you abuse your kids, or you kick your dogs. That's, that's, the, that's the displacement. Scapegoating is a form of displacement. And it's a way of redirecting that negative energy because it's too much to have inside you. For more evidence of displacement, you can just take a look at these movie posters. I think it's so interesting how they all have a similar orange-yellow color, even though orange-yellow is not a color that shows up in nuclear power plants nor in nuclear meltdowns. You'll recall orange shows up quite strongly in depictions of nuclear war, and you see it in these movie posters. China Syndrome, Die Volk is uh, The Cloud, a German movie, uh, sort of about Chernobyl, girl gets cancer and dies at the end, sorry to spoil it for you. And then the sort of the Asian version is Pandora, which is on Netflix. Um, and you can see it's sort of a more of a ring of fire Asian version where the reactors are like little volcanoes uh, with orange, glowing orange in there. When I was a boy in the late 70s, this poster hung on the, my dad's food co-op wall. And this is a a poster for a series of rock concerts that came out after China Syndrome and Three Mile Island. So China Syndrome comes out in 1979, and eight days later, Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania melts down. One of the famous stories is that the New York Daily News editor, when he wanted to assign reporters to cover Three Mile Island, he goes into the newsroom and goes, hey, who here has seen China Syndrome? And the reporters that raised their hand and said they'd seen it, he goes, okay, you're assigned to cover Three Mile Island. So they, they ended up that ended up framing much of their coverage of Three Mile Island. But 
you might understand why as a child and really as a young adult, I didn't understand that there was really any difference between nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons. I thought that if a nuclear power plant melted down, that there would be an explosion, uh, a nuclear explosion and a mushroom cloud like over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because that's what's in this poster. This is not a poster to ban, about a movement to ban nuclear weapons. It's about, about banning nuclear power plants. So nuclear accidents become like little explosions. Nuclear power plants become like little bombs. One of the most curious things I always try to understand is, you know, why are we so afraid of nuclear waste? When I, when I was an anti-nuclear activist, I used to think that nuclear waste was liquid and green because I got my information from The Simpsons. And then as you get older, you realize about this amount of uranium fuel provides all the energy from nuclear that you would need in your entire life. So as an environmentalist, you can see what the benefits are of it. Such a small amount of material throughput, it's supposed to be solid, though, forget that this is water, comes out the other end, and that's what we call waste. It's just the used fuel rods that come out, they cool for a little bit, and then they're stored on land in big cans. And from an environmental point of view, nuclear waste is the best because it's not pollution. The seven million people that die every year from air pollution, that's just the waste from burning fossil fuels and biomass that goes into the atmosphere. But since nuclear doesn't produce any air or water pollution, it's just a, it's easy to manage waste. But yet we're incredibly scared of nuclear waste. Why? It's hard not to imagine that what we're doing is we're displacing our anxieties around nuclear weapons onto the waste. The waste itself becomes little bombs. Another, another piece of evidence that suggests that displacement is occurring is that when you do surveys around the world and you ask people how many people think do you, how many people do you think died at Chernobyl, people say about 100,000, which happens to be the same number of people that died at Hiroshima and died at Nagasaki. So seem to be projecting our our ideas about those accidents onto, onto Chernobyl. Obviously in Japan, this has a more acute history than anywhere else. And you start to see uh, movies in the 50s that are monster movies where the monsters are created by the radiation. So uh, the original Gojira, Godzilla, comes out several months after the, the Japanese fishing boat, which I, I've, I can't remember the Japanese name, uh, Lucky Dragon. What is it? Did you guys all hear that? Uh, is caught, yeah, is, is, is accidentally caught in a US nuclear test in the South Pacific and the, and the fishermen come back to Japan and, they've, and they're suffering from acute radiation syndrome and one of the, one of the fishermen dies and Susan Sontag, the great literary critic, the great late literary critic, um, she writes this famous essay in the late 60s where she says, what's going on in these monster movies, in Godzilla, but also, you know, we have these movies where like a spider gets radiated and becomes a huge monster, and then the military and the scientists work together to kill the monster, that what we're doing is that we're trying to temporarily resolve the anxiety created by our cognitive dissonance by killing off this monster. Has anybody seen the new Godzilla, the 2014 Godzilla, the US, the sequel? So in the new Godzilla, it's really, it's really up to date. It's got an environmentalist message in it. I'm gonna spoil it for you, sorry. <laughs> Close your ears if you do wanna see it. Um, which is that Mothra comes up from the deep of the earth, so they come come out of the earth, onto the surface of the earth, and Mothra's, the two Mothras eat uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear submarine reactors, nuclear power plant reactors, and then Godzilla comes after it, and the Japanese scientists, the U.S. military, wants to, wants to nuke the Godzilla and the Mothra, but the Japanese scientist says, no, no, let Godzilla kill Mothra, and restore the natural order, restore the natural balance. So Godzilla comes back and becomes a good guy, and indeed, that's what happens. Godzilla eats the Mothra, almost dies, valiantly saves humans, and goes back to the earth. And there's this, this cycle, this sort of regeneration cycle that we put on, and is sort of the sense in which nuclear 
really shouldn't have ever, we should never have created it. It should never have been here. And I see that with the, with the waste. The nuclear industry is absolutely obsessed with wanting to bury nuclear waste, which I've, I've never understood. It's just sitting there like on a parking lot near the plant. As an environmentalist, I think, well, that's exactly what we've always wanted, is we've wanted the production process, we've wanted the waste product to be contained in the productive process and not externalized to the environment. But the, the industry and, 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 and many anti-nuclear people want the waste buried. And I think you can only understand that anthropologically or symbolically, that we want to return nuclear. We want to we put the genie back in the bottle. We want to put the evil spirits that were unleashed from Pandora's box back into the box. We know we can't at some level, but we express that desire nonetheless through our advocacy for nuclear waste policy as well as in our, our Hollywood movies. I, I think there's other evidence that the Japanese have a, have a deeper fear of nuclear weapons than others do, including in Asia. There was, uh, uh, in 2017, when North Korea was shooting, was testing missiles over Japan, 67% of South Koreans said that they wanted to get a nuclear weapon. Whereas just five, somewhere between five and 10% of Japanese want a nuclear weapon. It's hard to understand that difference without imagining it. Now you could say, well, maybe that's because the South Koreans are closer to North Korea, but the truth is at that point, North Korea had missiles that could hit Tokyo. So uh, you would imagine, you would think that if the attitudes were the same, that you'd have similar levels of support for a quieter weapon, but they were just much higher in South Korea than in Japan. And while Fukushima is, you know, an obvious proximate reason for the rise of anti-nuclear attitudes in Japan, there's plenty of evidence that Japan was pretty anti-nuclear before Fukushima. One of the surveys that I saw showed that support within Japan for building new nuclear plants in 2005 was 22%. So only 20% only of the public supported building nuclear plants uh, in 2005. By 2011, that number had reduced, had gone down to 7%. So maybe Fukushima caused the reduction or maybe support for building nuclear plants would have gone down. That certainly appears to be what the trajectory was of declining support for nuclear plants. I think the psychology here is complex. It's interesting to me that the two countries that are the most anti-nuclear energy, two of the countries the most anti-nuclear energy are also the most anti-nuclear weapons, Germany and Japan. And these are two countries that were basically denied a nuclear weapon under pressure from the United States after World War II. Britain and France got nuclear weapons. The United States really didn't want Britain and France to get nuclear weapons, but they did get nuclear weapons, whereas Germany and Japan didn't. So one possibility is that some of their the resistance to nuclear weapons is entirely rational in Japan and Germany, which is sort of, well, if we can't have nuclear weapons, then we don't want anybody else to have them. So one question is just whether some of the real world events that have been occurring since Fukushima have contributed to anxiety about nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. I think, um, coincidentally or not, we saw China step up its activities in the South China Sea in late 2011. Over the last uh, seven years, as all of you know, China has built, has created 3,200 acres of land in the South China Sea in the process of turning seven formerly underwater islands or reefs into military bases. In 2012, China occupied a reef called Scarborough Shoal that belonged to the Philippines in what were known as the Spratly Islands. Uh, the United States decided not to back up Philippines in its demands that China halt building. Quote, the U.S. failure to support its ally in the Scarborough standoff, one military analyst told the New York Times, demonstrated to people like Philippines President Duterte that he had no other option than to kowtow to China. The South China Sea, as all of you know, is of great importance to the security of this region. 
one third of all global shipping traffic moves through the South China Sea. It's also home to oil and gas fields, fisheries, hundreds of disputed reefs and islands. In 2013, China declared an air defense identification zone over two thirds of the East China Sea and warned nations not to fly over it. The Japanese government refused to acknowledge the Chinese air defense identification zone, but the US backed down and we told our commercial airliners to avoid the area. And those little differences become very noticeable to China and everywhere else. Now we hear Chinese military soldiers are yelling at American Air Force pilots over the radio, ordering them to stay clear of the area. Closer to home, the Chinese have become increasingly aggressive over the Senkaku Islands. This is another, this is Mischief Reef. You can see the radar towers there. In 2012, law enforcement ships belonging to Japan and China had a standoff near the islands, and in 2013, a, China, a Chinese ship locked its radar weapon system onto a J Japanese ship. What about the international law? Does not international law cover this dispute? In 2016, an international court issued a ruling in favor of the Philippines against China in a Scarborough Reef dispute. China just ignored the ruling. We forget that the international arena is anarchic. There is no global government to enforce these disputes. Or if you call the United Nations a global government, just an assemblage of nations, there's no one there to enforce it. The Japanese reassure themselves that the US will protect it, but that very same year, Donald Trump said, quote, if the United States keeps on its path, Japan is going to want to have nuclear weapons with or without me discussing it because I don't think they feel very secure in what's going on with our country. Trump's comment is really interesting. He said, Japan may not feel secure with what's going on in our country, in the United States. He wasn't talking about what's happening in Japan. By 2018, the incoming head of the US Indo-Pacific Command told Congress, China is now capable of controlling the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war with the United States. As China's military power grows relative to the United States, and it will, a retired US Navy officer told the New York Times, questions will also grow regarding America's ability to deter Beijing's use of force. Did these things contribute to growing anxiety in Japan around nuclear weapons and nuclear energy? I don't know. But what's clear is that the conversation about what Japan would need to do if the US security guarantee went away is not happening. There's a new book out by Sheila Smith from the Council on Foreign Relations, which, as you all probably know, is the think tank that sort of represents establishment thinking in the United States. And Sheila Smith's one of the top analysts there. She wrote a book called Japan Rearmed, which came out last week. I was on the phone with her for about an hour and a half. She says, even the call for an independent military strategy as a hedge against the possible decline in US strategic protection for Japan is absent in today's debate in Japan. If anything, Tokyo security planners and the Japanese public seem to have doubled down on their investment in the alliance with the United States. Is this a kind of cognitive dissonance? One of the interesting findings of psychologists when they study cognitive dissonance is that when our beliefs are contradicted by the real world, sometimes we just end up believing even more in our prior beliefs. So if it looks like the US security guarantee is weakening in Japan, we just more strongly affirm that the US security guarantee is strong. And so the Japanese people express much less concern around the rise of China's military power and other threats than, than really anybody else does, including both the Americans, Chinese, and South Koreans. Maybe they have more faith that the US will protect them than Americans do. There's some evidence for this in a survey that finds that where 56% of Japanese say they want the United States to intervene militarily if China threatens the Senkaku Islands, only 33% of Americans want to intervene militarily on behalf of Japan. If I were Japanese, this would be a, a, a gap that would concern me. Now, you know, maybe if, if the Chinese really started stepping up, ratcheting up threats to the Senkaku, the United States public will become really eager to help militarily. That might happen. 
I will say that um, my experience in the United States the last several years is that we're really tired of intervening militarily. The wars in the Middle East where the United States participated in the killing of 440,000 Iraqis at a cost of over $3 trillion, resulting in the worst terrorist group that we've ever seen in the Middle East, known as ISIS, I think has made Americans weary. And that's not just Trump Republicans. I think it also goes for Bernie Sanders supporters as well. I think the other interesting thing, though, is that even though the Japanese have a lot of confidence in the United States that we would or should intervene militarily, the Japanese have a pretty low view of Americans on two, I think, key areas. 94% of Americans say that the Japanese are hardworking, but only 25% of Japanese say Americans are hardworking. This kind of hurt my feelings a little bit when I read this, because uh, we work pretty hard. Um, I mean, if there's lazy people, I think we all know that it's the French, right? <laughs> I don't know why we're blamed for that. We work pretty hard. They work 35 hours a week. Um, so the Japanese don't think that Americans are very hardworking. Americans, 71% of Americans say that the Japanese are honest. Only 37% of Japanese say that Americans are honest, which raises a really interesting question. Um, why, if you think Americans are not trustworthy or hardworking, would you be so confident that they're going to intervene on your behalf in a military confrontation with China? It's notable that Trump's not the first US president to question the US security commitment to Japan. In 2010, the Obama administration floated the idea of a no first use policy with regards to nuclear weapons. A no first use policy would mean that the United States would never use nuclear weapons first in any kind of military confrontation. And that sounds good, because if everybody had a no first use policy, then you wouldn't ever use nuclear weapons. But both the Japanese and the European allies absolutely threw a fit. Um, the idea was floated, so it was never even formally proposed, but it was killed in the crib because of concerns by, for example, the Japanese, that if we said that we wouldn't use nuclear weapons first, that we would be leaving Japan vulnerable to a conventional attack by Russia or China or somebody else. The Japanese insisted that we stand by the nuclear guarantee of Japan. So I think sometimes people think, or maybe even many Japanese think, that, that there's no nuclear weapons protecting Japan. But in fact, nuclear weapons protection of Japan is an essential part of US security arrangement for Japan. Although I think if you asked most millennials, most people under 30 in the United States, if the United States is committed to taking a nuclear bullet for Japan, I think most people would have no idea what you're talking about. I don't think people under 30, maybe even under 40, know that the United States has that commitment to Japan. Every time the US commitment wavers, whether it's under Obama or Trump, the Japanese government asks the US to reaffirm their commitment to Japan. And we do. And they get up and there's a press conference and we say, we will defend Japan, absolutely. But it increasingly rings hollow, I think. It increasingly rings untrue. It's, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, um, people that talk the most about sinners and sin and how we have to get rid of sin are places where you suspect there's m the most sin going on. One doth protest too much. Japan's considered acquiring nuclear weapons three times in the past. The first time was in 1964 when China got the bomb. The second time was in the 1970s when Japan was considering signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which it did. And then the third time Japan considered getting the bomb was um, in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War when it was wondering whether or not the US commitment would remain. In all three of those instances, Japanese security uh, community decided that with a similar nuclear deterrent as France and Britain have, just one leg of the triad, which would be submarines, that they could guarantee Japanese security. Um, 
you don't need, they don't necessarily need bombers and land-based missiles that really with submarines, Japan could, could defend itself. This is what the French call the force de frappe or is called a counter strike force or a second strike force. It would be strictly for self-defense and in Sheila Smith's new book, she argues that if Japan did decide to get nuclear weapons that it would be constitutional because it would be self-defense. In other words, and this is what we know about 75 years of nuclear weapons is that they're, they're not useful for offensive, they're not useful for waging war, nuclear weapons. We, we, United States has nuclear weapons and we keep invading countries and trying to get them to do what we want them to do with conventional weapons. But nuclear weapons, as Thomas Schelling famously said, are very useful for deterrence but not useful for compellence. Hard to make people do things with nuclear weapons. But if you have submarines circulating, it guarantees that you can punish your adversaries uh, by taking out their major cities with nuclear weapons. So that's what the, the a submarine deterrent does, sort of an immune system uh, for a country. In response to our wavering commitment, Smith writes, Tokyo, if the US were to fail to defend Japan in a crisis, Smith says that Tokyo will, quote, start thinking about an alliance with another great power or review Japan's nuclear options. It's hard to imagine Japan making an alliance with Russia or China, very hard. Much easier to imagine it developing nuclear weapons. Already Japan has enough plutonium on hand to build 6,000 warheads. It has a very well-developed rocketry program. So Japan has what security analysts call a hedging strategy for nuclear latency. What's notable is that the Japanese are much more confident in US power than Americans are. When asked at the present time, which nation do you feel is stronger in terms of military economic power, the US or China, or do you think they're about equal? Japanese much more strongly rate the United States as stronger than China, stronger than I mean Americans rate ourselves militarily or economically. Meanwhile, I think it's clear that the US military has worn out its welcome in Okinawa. In February, 72% of Okinawans voted against an expansion of a US military base there. I think it's fair to say that it's not a big part of America's national identity to be an occupying force in other countries. We've certainly had our share of imperial adventures, but the United States has never imagined itself a colonial power, and I think it's I think it's fair to say that it makes us uneasy at the idea of being an unwelcome occupier anywhere in the world, particularly in a nation that's such a close friend of ours as Japan. Smith and other experts argue that the United States should not withdraw from Okinawa despite the 72% opposition to the expansion of military bases because there's episodes in our history that didn't work, that, that showed the dangers of the United States with, with withdrawing from the world and, and pulling back and just defending ourselves. Though it's notable that those were all instances before the invention of nuclear weapons. What nuclear weapons do is that they level the playing field between small and large powers. The revolutionary nature of nuclear weapons was obscured, I think, by the fact that the two dominant powers with nuclear weapons were the two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. They had huge arsenals. But I think with North Korea, you start to see the power of nuclear weapons for underdogs. So there's basically no chance that the United States will invade North Korea at this point. I think Donald Trump has made that clear. His advisor, Steve Bannon, made it clear when he left the White House. And the difference, of course, when you have a nuclear deterrent and not, is sort of how you can behave at lower levels of conflict. So at the top of the escalation ladder for Chinese, is nuclear weapons. But the top of the escalation ladder for Japanese boats in a face-off in Senkaku is the United States. So it's a shakier, it's a shakier top of your escalation ladder. And I think it's clear that the US commitment is weaker than ever. We keep conceding territory to China, questioning our security commitments, and I think there's little question that the US would be very reluctant to sacrifice New York for Tokyo much less a few uninhabited islands of the Senkaku. 
So I think one question is, what can the security community learn from Fukushima? You recall the story I told where the plant manager, Yoshida, didn't want to raise the seawall because he didn't want to scare the local community. He was afraid of the social awkwardness of, of raising the seawall and acknowledging some amount of risk. Uh, it'd be a tragedy to make the same mistake with regards to Japan's security, to just not have the conversation about the US security commitment to Japan because we're afraid that it'll make people uncomfortable. Will it make people uncomfortable? I don't think there's any question about it. Um, but recall that the criticism of uh, the, invest the independent investigation was that Japanese institutions had, quote, a reluctance to question authority, quote, a devotion to sticking with the program, quote, insularity. I think similar criticisms could be leveled at both the US and Japanese security community with regards to what might happen if the US security commitment continues to weaken. Now, some Japanese have already called for a reassessment of our security arrangement. On March 20th, my friend Nobuo Tanaka, the man who first brought me to Fukushima, posted on his Facebook page, quote, I visited USS Illinois, Virginia-class nuclear submarine at Yokosuka. Geopolitical changes in Asia may force Japan to have a nuclear subfleet. The Virginia-class submarine is a $3 billion vessel. It can launch dozens of nuclear-tipped torpedoes and missiles. I think in practical terms, the Japanese Diet could take a page from the Fukushima investigation and commission an independent investigation into whether Japan needs its own nuclear deterrent if the US security guarantee continues to weaken or go away. Again, would that frighten people in Japan? Well, probably. Is that the worst thing? outcome that we could imagine? I think Americans need to change, too. We've imagined for a long time that the nuclear bomb is sort of uniquely ours. We've always tried to prevent people from getting it. And yet our, our, our opponents get it, our friends get it, nuclear weapons continue to spread. And the data on what happens with, with the rise of nuclear weapons is pretty clear. This is a created by Oxford University think tank, Our World in Data, that shows total war and battle deaths from 1400 all the way through 2000. And what you see is that a rising number of deaths occur over the last 600 years. Very interestingly, you see the rise of gunpowder here, what they call the military revolution that allowed the consolidation of nation states in Europe and in Japan as well. And what's happened since 1945 is equally dramatic. You can see the number of deaths in battles and wars has declined precipitously. Now you might argue, well, that doesn't, that's just a coincidence. That's not because of nuclear weapons. It's just a correlation. But I, I think you'd have to then acknowledge that the spread of nuclear weapons hasn't led to more wars and deaths. It's strongly correlated with increasing stability and peace. Well, maybe that's just the US and the Soviet Union. Maybe it's just unique to the United States and the Soviet Union. That's what uh, most security analysts said after the Cold War when India and Pakistan were inching their way to getting nuclear weapons. In fact, the claim was widely made by US security analysts that if India and Pakistan got the bomb, they would use it on each other, that there would be nuclear war between India and Pakistan. That was the conventional view, right up there with the idea that the Soviet Union would last in their 50 years, that, the, uh, that there would never be overthrows of Arab governments, that the Iraqis would welcome us as liberators. In terms of predictions, you can see how wrong it was. Battle deaths between India and Pakistan declined precipitously when the two countries got weapons in 1999. The last big conflict uh, in, in 71 was a total of uh, seven, over 7,000 deaths. The next conflict had just around 500 deaths. And many of you may not remember, but there was a war between India and Pakistan earlier this year. I'd say war, war. 40 people were killed by a terrorist bombing of Indian police officers by Pakistani terrorists linked to Pakistani security forces. The Indians launched a jet plane. The Pakistanis shot, uh, knocked it down. They said, give us our pilot. And basically, they said, 
we're not going to escalate because we have weapons on both sides. I think it's um, pretty clear that we get these two technologies mixed up, and quite understandably. Nuclear bombs, nuclear reactors. They're siblings. They're not twins. They're not the same. When the one on the right malfunctions, it doesn't go off like a bomb. On the other hand, you can use the technology on the right to make the ingredients of the technology on the left. And I think the nuclear industry in particular, for whom I directed these remarks two days ago, has attempted to deny any relationship between these two technologies. And as far as I can tell, the only people who think there's no relationship are people in the nuclear industry. Most everybody else understands that there's a relationship. But I think it's important to be clear about what kind of a relationship it is, that it's a sibling relationship, that the technology on the right provides latency, as Japan has, being three to six months away from having nuclear weapons, but that they're not the same. When you enrich uranium to 95%, you can get a bomb. When you enrich uranium to 5%, you can produce the cleanest form of electricity known to humankind, and I would argue the only technology capable of preventing catastrophic climate change. Is this going to reassure everybody about nuclear energy? Of course not at least not right away. Some amount of the public I don't think is ever going to appreciate this technology, but I also think this is a technology that is so revolutionary, so shocking in its birth. It is as though gunpowder and fossil fuels were invented the same year, as opposed to being invented continents apart, centuries apart, and we're still getting over the trauma of this birth of this revolutionary weapon. Humankind has never gotten rid of a technology that we've created, and there's no way to get rid of this one. So what I would say is that in order to make peace with nuclear power, we're going to have to learn how to make peace with the bomb. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm very sorry. I wasn't here the first 10 minutes, so if you talked about this, I'm, I'm sorry for doubling up. but. Um, about the recycling cycle of nuclear energy, um, you said that it's much safer than all the... So y you said that you don't know why we are um, burying the spent fuel. Right. <coughs> um, my question is that, for example, in Japan, there is the Monju re reactor at the uh, northern side of Japan, and that one had a catastroph catastrophic failure in the past and was shut down. And to my understanding, there is no a fuel cycle going on at all, anywhere. So um, do you have any kind of numbers on that? Because the recycling of uh, nuclear fuel, there are some breeder reactors, but no actual recycling into? The French recycle, the French reprocess. And do they reuse it? Yes. Oh, OK. But it's not necessary. I don't think you need to do it. In fact, I think it's preferable and cheaper to just do a once through fuel cycle. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of uranium. There's, it's the smallest environmental impact, and you reduce humankind's footprint. So I don't think you need to do it. I think a lot of countries did it and wanted to do it in part so that they could create weapons latency. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing when people kind of go, it seems like there's something secret going on with nuclear energy. <laughs> that's what it was. Mm -hmm. and do you think it's so much? Um, just speak. Ah, sorry. Is it so much cleaner than wind or solar power? Because yes. you said it's the cleanest one. Absolutely. So solar panels create two to 300 times more waste, more toxic waste, than nuclear plants do. Uh, n solar panels contain lead, cadmium, chromium, elements that are always toxic. There is no safe storage of solar panels anywhere. They're going to join the electronic waste stream. And thinking that their benevolent solar panel owners in Europe and the United States are going to send them to Africa, where they'll be used for another five or maybe 10 years before they're probably smashed up um, so that people can get at the valuable elements inside of them. So in terms of toxic exposure, uh, you're looking at some pretty serious consequences from solar panels joining the electronic waste stream. MOX fuel is not toxic, so uh, uranium fuel enriched with uh, plutonium. No, I mean, nuclear fuel is toxic. <laughs> I mean, if you stand next to a reactor, you're going to die. I mean, 
But I mean, we have been looking for a single death from, nu from used nuclear fuel, from nuclear waste, haven't been able to find a single one. So if it's such a, if it's such a deadly waste product, it sure doesn't, it's sure not very deadly. So um, cases of cancer increases in cancer uh, percentages are not related to nuclear radiation at all. Nowhere, not in Pripyat, well, where I, Chernobyl I mean, was. You miss, I went through the Chernobyl data in some detail. So yes, there has been, um, but about 200 deaths in total are estimated from Chernobyl. Hi, Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I I want to ask a question about the clarification about the talk as a whole. Because I was, by the end, a bit confused by it because it started out uh, on a, a note about the safety of nuclear power. But by the end, it was an endorsement of nuclear proliferation to some extent, that Japan should acquire a nuclear weapon, or at least get more comfortable with the idea of that. And then only in the very last sentence, you s somehow got to this point where you're saying that in order to accept nuclear energy, we need to become more accept. We need to feel safer about having nuclear weapons at the same time. But at the beginning of the talk, you also chastised the anti-nuclear movement for conflating bombs and nuclear power. Right. So I'm. I was left confused uh, about this relationship that you're trying to draw out and. I also would like you to speak a little bit about sort of the morality of also endorsing nuclear weapons as a way of uh, trying to get us to accept more nuclear power, uh, which sure. I, I'm not sure why you're, be, you're joining them. Okay, so, so just to be clear, um, I, you know, um, I'm, it's not for me to say if Japan needs nuclear weapons. As a friend of Japan, what I would like to say is that I think that the U.S. security commitment to Japan is weakening and that I would encourage them to have a conversation about what to do if the U.S. security guarantee goes away, which includes a nuclear shield for Japan. But it's Japan's decision on how to protect itself. It's a sacred duty of Japanese society and its leaders to how to protect itself. Um, the second issue is that, yes, uh, Nuclear weapons are not nuclear reactors, and we should distinguish what they are, but we should also acknowledge that there's a relationship, and that to get nuclear weapons, you need nuclear reactors to create, or you need enrichment to create the weapons material. And in terms of the bomb, I'm, I'm making actually two separate points. One is uh, prescriptive and one is normative. Uh, I'm sorry, one is uh, predictive and one is normative. The predictive one is that the spread of nuclear weapons spreads peace on Earth. In fact, nuclear weapons are the greatest cause of peace over the last 75 years of any, any single thing. They're a technical fix to war. Um, so as a normative issue, I think that we have a moral obligation to mature our view of this technology and, and develop a more evolved view of the technology. And we should accept the fact, for example, that North Korea has the bomb and we should stop trying to get them to get rid of it. North Korea has the bomb and it means that we're not gonna invade. If Iraq had had the bomb, then we wouldn't have invaded and there'd be 440,000 more people alive in Iraq today. So in terms of the morality of it, I think that you have to question the morality of leaving Iraq unarmed and leaving them vulnerable to attack from a power like, like us. I don't think you can trust the United States not to invade other countries. Though that assumes that we'll never use nuclear weapons. No, it doesn't. In fact, the only way that nuclear weapons, the way that nuclear weapons have kept us safe is that we've been afraid of them. Yeah, but in order for that correlation to continue to hold, we must never use them. And Which correlation? The, that nuclear weapons make us safe. So yeah. no, if, I mean, if we actually, uh, were ever, to, I mean, they have been used before the, um, here in Japan. So if that were ever to break again, then the consequences of that could be actually quite very dramatic. Of course. But let's be clear, but the record is, the record of nuclear weapons has been only to end war and prevent war. That's all nuclear weapons have done in the real world. 
Obviously, nobody wants nuclear weapons to be used, but the number of people killed by conventional weapons in Iraq alone is four Hiroshima's. So let's be careful with our morality that we not treat Hiroshima's. I mean, a million people died in Tokyo of conventional fire bombings, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we sort of imagine that those are less immoral deaths and the weapons are less immoral than the use of atomic weapons. So I'm suggesting that that, that that kind of facile distinction of conventional weapons being okay and nuclear weapons being wrong is wrong, and we need to move beyond it. Hi, uh, thanks for coming again. Um, can you refresh my memory what you said about Japan? Do you think they're going towards nuclear weapons, or I can't remember if you spoke on that. Yeah, it was my it was about an hour of my talk. Um, yeah, yeah, no, but I'm saying like, I think that Japan is is not. I agree with Sheila Smith and mm -hmm. my Japanese friends that I've been interviewing. I think Japan is not having a conversation about what to do if the U.S. security guarantee, including the U.S. nuclear guarantee, goes away. Mm -hmm. I think that that is a huge problem because it's better to talk about possibilities than to shove our heads in the sand and hope that they'll never occur. Because that was the metaphor of Fukushima, remember? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we don't raise the seawall, then you know, maybe there will never be a tsunami. Right, so that leads me to my next question. What yeah. my main question was, with the sort of revisions that they kind of do to Article 9 uh, reinterpretations, do you see, if they do another one like that, do you see them kind of going more towards a nuclear stance or? I mean, I, I don't know, and I'm not honestly that interested in my own predictions. Expert predictions are lousy, by the way. Mm. Experts are <laughs> terrible at predictions. The security experts are the worst at predictions. In fact, you'd be better off betting against security predictions, security expert predictions. I do, and I don't think predictions are important in this case. Um, I mean, I think some broad predictions that Japan needs protection, mm. that China's aggressive, that China needs to be balanced, what alarms me is that China is not balanced. There is no balance of power in the Asia Pacific region. Proof of that is the Chinese takeover of the South, uh, South China Sea. And we say, well, but we won't let that happen to the Senkaku. Really? I mean, that seems like a pretty confident prediction. So what I'm encouraging my, my friends in Japan to do is to have a conversation about what to do if the US security guarantee goes away. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you sort of raised two points in this presentation. The first was that nuclear energy is important to save the world from global warming. And the second is that nuclear proliferation kind of helps to promote a more peaceful world, right? So my question is, can you talk more about the connection between the two? Do you think that nuclear proliferation helps bridge this cognitive dissonance to help people with their fear of nuclear? Or do you think that the relationship extends beyond that or in any other way? So first of all, the word proliferation is just propaganda. There's nobody that supports proliferation. What proliferation means is the rapid spread of weapons. Um, what we've had is the slow spread of weapons. We've had about one new nuclear armed state every 10 years. Um, I suspect that there will be more nuclear armed states in the future. Um, I think that North Korea is obviously a nuclear armed state. It's going to stay a nuclear armed state. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It's never going to give up that weapon because it, it couldn't without putting itself in jeopardy of military action. Um, so I'm saying two separate things. I'm saying we have to grow up and get used to the fact that nuclear weapons are never going to go away, or at least not in any conceivable, not for hundreds of years, or at least for a very long time. They're not going to go away. So, um, and so I'm, in that sense, I'm talking to the left. We're not gonna prohibit them. So we should be doing other things, and that's a longer talk, but basically, one of the beautiful things that happens when two countries get nuclear weapons is that they have it in their interests instantly to help each other to safely manage their nuclear arsenals. So we see Indian and Pakistani generals that get together, retired generals, current generals getting together, making sure that they're 
going to have really good command and control of their weapons. After the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union went through a bunch of steps to make sure there would be no accidental usage. That's something that if you're anti-nuclear weapons or pro-nuclear weapons or anywhere in between, everybody supports that. Um, but my point about nuclear energy is, my hypothesis is that given that nuclear weapon, the fear of nuclear weapons is what's animating opposition to nuclear energy, that until we make peace with the fact that nuclear weapons are here to stay, that we will never accept nuclear energy and that nuclear energy will not fulfill its potential to, to basically lift everybody out of poverty and protect the natural environment, including the climate. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, um, thank, you, thank you for your speech. And I basically have a lack of knowledge of um, nuclear uh, energy. And I have found that I, I know that many people are kind of um, concerned about the fact that um, many um, nuclear uh, plant, plantations um, sure. make a lot of uh, nuclear, uh, well, not, no, not nuclear, uh, radioactives. Uh -huh. Is the word right? And sure. um, due to the uh, the ac accidents that we had in Japan, people are um, kind of concerned. Where do they? Well, how do people? How do the? Um, uh, the experts uh, deal with the the radioactives? And can you please elaborate <coughs> about that? Thank you. Sure. So the best available science on Fukushima shows that the radiation that escaped from the reactor will kill zero people. Um, there was an over-evacuation. And I'm not trying to suggest that there shouldn't have been an evacuation. I think it's understandable that there was an evacuation. But there were 60,000 people that evacuated and stayed away for way too long. You know, um, the, the recent research by radi independent radiation scientists suggests that there should not be evacuations in the future. You know, you're kind of, they were pulling people out of nursing homes and hospitals these 2,000 deaths. Some of these deaths are from suicides, depression, other factors that are caused by that dislocation. Um, there was a study done, for example, in the British Medical, it was published in the British Medical Journal of, of 8,000 residents of Fukushima, done by nine scientists from Britain and, and Japan. And they found that people living in the most contaminated radioactive parts of Fukushima, where they were ingesting large amounts of radiation, still had radiation levels lower than deemed dangerous. So the, bo the bottom line is just that radiation is not the super potent carcinogen that we all thought it was. If you get too much radiation, you'll die. No question about it. Um, some of the best research um, comes from the, the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And what we found is that people who received radiation at 1,000 times what is today considered the safe limit had a 10% higher chance of getting cancer. Right? Um, it's a tragedy for anybody to get cancer, but 40% of us get cancer. Um, so a 10% increase, it's, it's terrible, but it also gives you a sense that that's maybe not as, as big of an increase as you might imagine. Um, people at that level of exposure lived 16 months longer, 16 months shorter, sorry. They died 16 months sooner than others. So radiation is, at high levels, a dangerous carcinogen. But it's also not, the picture I think we have is that you go to Fukushima, or you eat something with some radioactive material and your, your, your chance of cancer goes through the roof. That's just grossly exaggerated. And my argument, though, was that the reason we exaggerate it is not accidental, but that the exaggeration is due to fear of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, so do you, are you aware of there being any correlational studies between uh, the fear of nuclear, I guess, energy, power, whatnot, with um, disasters, natural disasters, such as earthquakes or even tsunamis? You mean other than Fukushima? Oh, just uh, in, yeah, reference to Fukushima and whatnot. Well, I mean, certainly um, nuclear plants, the concern with the nuclear plants is that you don't have accidents that trigger a meltdown. I think it's interesting that Fukushima Daiichi appears, there's still some investigations going on, appears to have survived the earthquake, even though it was designed at a, to survive much lower, much smaller earthquakes than the one it survived. And, and what failed 
were the preparations for dealing with tsunami. It could have survived the tsunami if they'd raised the seawalls, if they had not put the backup diesel generators underground where they got wet, and if they had really kept the cores cold with water right away. So I think even, you know, in, I think nuclear plants have proven very, to be very resilient when faced with serious natural disasters, but obviously you have to be prepared. Um, hi, Michael. It's Asby Brown from SafeCast. It's hey, good to see you again. See you. Yeah. Um, we had an interesting Twitter exchange of the data comparing, using SafeCast data to compare irradiation in Fukushima and, uh, and uh, Colorado, and one person was saying that it proves that it's dangerous, and Michael was saying, no, it proves that it's actually not so bad. So it was very interesting that the same data can be used to uh, reinforce different points. But that's not what I want to talk about. Um, I appreciate your framing overall, and I think it's probably helpful for a lot of people. Um, and sort the sorts of things that I get very, and our, our project is very involved in this is, you know, when you're on the ground uh, specifically uh, trying to help people who've been through this accident, um, trying to help them understand risks, um, you know, a lot of what looms very large are these ethical implications, part of it about culpability, who's responsible, uh, why. And then depending on that, this, the statements from different experts uh, may be seen as excessively dismissive. Uh, statements from the other side may be <clears throat> clearly alarmist. And obviously the reality is much more nuanced. Um, I guess um, like one point you made, for instance, about um, the fact that lots of people, even in fairly uh, contaminated areas of Fukushima, when they have internal contamination screening, um, that there shows fairly low levels of contamination. That's been fairly consistent. And it's only because the government implemented very quickly food controls, which is because without that, it could have been much worse. So, um, you know, there are uh, risks and they're hard to communicate uh, you know, what you need to know and how you need to know. And when you add the ethical um, grievances, et cetera, that, that uh, loom large in the, people's lives, the lives of people who are dealing with this, um, that becomes another issue. And maybe you can address that. Um, the other, other thing is um, um, human factors, right? I mean, think about nuclear. I, I agree. I, I have a fair amount of faith in the technology and the development of technology. I'm not so sure about the costs, um, but all these accidents, uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, almost every other accident can be led to human factors. And I wonder if you've thought about those issues, you have something to offer about, um, are there solutions? Can we become better and more reliable humans uh, that we don't uh, do something like allow, you talked about the seawall, that's a perfect example, allow these things to get out of control and, and cause these very large, long-lasting uh, disasters. Can you just, thank you. Can you just clarify the first question? Because I just want to make sure I understand the I, question. I on guess the ethical I, was, issue. I was wondering what you've observed or what you think about or how you would address um, uh, the problems of communicating risks uh, in a way that, that really incorporates the nuances and the actual ethical uh, issues, the actual eth ethical grievances. And I, I, again, a kind of a analogy I use is yeah, maybe the risks can be low. Right for certain dose levels, and again, you talk about these. You know, for what dose rate, how many percentage? It's a stochastic thing. If someone steals a penny off of my desk, uh, that's not a big loss to me. It's not fair. But if someone comes into the the, the classroom and steals a penny off of a hundred people's desks, it's a different kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And for me, this highlights the ethical issues and and the need for you know accountability and and that sort of thing. So I'm yeah. just wondering if you ever have those discussions or if it factors into your perception about how to move forward with this stuff. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I mean I think the interesting thing about radiation and the special thing about radiation is that it's easy to detect at very low levels. So we understand so much about how the body works by attaching uh, radioactive tracers and, and being able to track bodily processes, right? It's one of the great gifts of radiation that we're able to do that. There's so, m most everything else, most every other risk that we face is not, you're not able to measure it with that level of specificity. So for example, how would we measure the risk of dislocation, of not living in your community, your home? I mean, I get stressed out just traveling for like a week. I gotta be in Berkeley with my dogs you know, or I'm just a mess, right? I mean, how do you measure it for months or, you know, uh, uh, years? Um, how do you measure that stress? It's very tricky, right? You can really measure 
the risk with radiation, but then how do you measure it against air pollution, stress, dislocation? So I think the ethical issues are confounded by the, the difficulty of measuring, um, to getting a full risk profile, so to speak. And so I think what ends up happening is that you end up obsessing over the, the, the risks that you can measure um, and, and not thinking, because you, you manage what you measure, right, to use the old business consultant um, uh, slogan. And so you can't measure so many other risks. I think the thing that I've learned so much about, I, my, my, my teacher on radiation is Geraldine Thomas, who started the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. And she, every time I kind of go, hey, well, what about these, you know, these parts here where they have higher rate, you know, what about, the, she's just always just like, look, man, it's just confounding. There's just so many other risk factors in people's lives. And people hate to hear it, right, because we're so sick of it. But diet, exercise, alcohol, smoking, driving in your car, right? Like there's just so many other risks that we have. So I think that we get drawn to this particular risk, both because of the weapons association, I think the mysteriousness of it, and the fact that it's so easy to measure. That's the second one. Oh, human factors. Well, I'm totally with you. I mean, this is a, a the, this is the problem, one of the many problems with the nuclear industry is that it's run by engineers who want a technical fix for every problem, including the social acceptance problem. And what we know, like exactly what you said, you read the Kemeny report on Three Mile Island, you read the Chernobyl reports, it's all about human factors, right? And so um, I think what's interesting is that when you improve human factors, one of the stories that anti-nuclear people tell is they say, well, you know, it's a trade-off. If you have higher safety, then, um, it, then the costs are higher, right? And if you try to reduce the costs, then there's more danger. Turns out that's not true. After Three Mile, Three Mile Island tried to be a blessing for the nuclear industry, the efficiency, what we call the capacity factors, the percentage of the year that nuclear plants were operating um, when Three Mile Island occurred was around 50%, half the year. They were, we were just not very good at running plants yet, right? 30 years after the invention of nuclear power, or 20, 20 years after the invention of nuclear power. After Three Mile Island, the industry got its shit together, tons of checklists, just banal stuff, um, checklists, procedures, training. Now we're at 92%, uh, nuclear plants are operating 92% of the year in the United States. So much more profitable when you are selling electricity for you know almost twice as much of the year than when you're not. So I'm totally with you. One interesting anecdote, DOE funded a collaboration between hospitals and nuclear plants to see what they could learn from each other. Many of you may know that hospitals kill thousands of people every year. I mean, I'm not, kill I'm not kidding, they literally kill, like, it's not just that they don't save lives. You go into the hospital, you put the IV in wrong, you get an infection, I mean, there's just, hospitals are dangerous places. So they funded, I'm serious, they really are. They, and, there, and there's, a, there's a, Atul Gawande writes, the New Yorker wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto on this. They did a collaboration between hospitals and nuclear plants to see what they could learn from each other. Within weeks, the hospitals were like, we have nothing to teach the nuclear plants. You know, that the nuclear plants are just much better organized, much better checklists. Um, I think that's more true in the United States, I don't mean to be sound chauvinist, but I think that's more true of the United States than it was here in Japan and maybe in some other countries, but I'm 100% with you. I'm, I'm sort of a, my colleague Mark and I, we, we're not for like the newfangled nuclear plants. Why? We like the plants that we have a lot of experience running, right? The plants that you have 30 years operating, you know, and the, and the engineers are always like, no, there's too many, we have to remove the pumps because there's a problem with the pumps, but then you replace the pumps and you get some other problem. Experience, experience, experience is what matters when it comes to cost and safety, both in construction and operation, and regulation, too. Not time for one more, man? I guess I'll be the last one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I take your point on mutually assured destruction as being a, a kind of disincentive for war. I was thinking this, is, this kind of logic is comparable to the debate on, on guns in the United States. Right? I mean, one argument people make is that if everyone had guns, then we're going to be safer. Um, but a compromise between, everyone also acknowledges that there's no way you're going to be able to take all the guns from people. So there's kind of a pragmatic concession that needs to be made here. But what about in terms of arms control as a factor in this? You know, so, which is a little more granular than just um, nuclear weapons to um, counterbalance each other. Thank you. 
Um, so are guns analogous to nuclear weapons? Absolutely not. Um, the empirical record is 100% different. I'm a huge, I, if it were up to me, I would ban all handguns in the United States. Just absolutely ban them all. Because I think that the empirical record is clear that the higher density of guns in a population, the higher number of gun deaths. And I don't want to reduce our gun violence in the United States to just the quantity of guns, because I think there's also something else going on. We have higher gun death and more mass shootings than, say, Canada does. But um, the difference between guns and nuclear weapons is that guns are not a technology like nuclear weapons, and, they're, and that the individual that controls a gun is not like a nation state that controls nuclear weapons. So the controls, all these things are just completely different. So I reject the analogy entirely. I'm, in, I'm strongly in favor of gun control. I don't, I think arms control, so arms control is a little bit more complex. Um, and I've written, I've, I've, I have a manuscript of a book on this issue that's coming out. And what we look, what we see in the history of nuclear arms control is, I don't want to call it public relations, but there's basically, we are, we are basically doing arms control along with modernizing our arsenals at every moment. And often the efforts at arms control just backfire. For example, we, the arms limitation treaty that Nixon um, and Kissinger negotiated in the early 70s, they allowed then multi warhead missiles that actually ended up increasing the number of warheads. Um, you know, um, so it's not to say that we shouldn't do arms control. I think the bigger issue is the one I mentioned that it's, and it really comes from conservatives, though I think if liberals had a more pragmatic view, we could arrive somewhere closer to the middle, which is that the, it's the bigger issue is this idea that you could win a nuclear war. I think it's really important um, to, to understand that you can't. Like, you, there's, no, there's no successful nuclear war possible. Um, and so the idea that you could get enough nuclear weapons to bomb the other guy's nuclear weapons and that you would be able to have some survival population is just ridiculous. So I think the French view, the British view, um, really most other countries' view, which is that you just need enough nuclear weapons to retaliate what they call the counter-strike or the second strike force. I think that's the right view. Now, to be fair, there's other progressive people like me that have been making that argument for 40 years, and we haven't been very successful <laughs> in the United States and the Soviet Union. But for me, establishing that as the, as the ethic, both pragmatically and normatively, is much more important than the specific arms control agreements. Um, for the audience here, and also the students especially, is there any of your writings that you particularly recommend or talks? I know you have a number of talks up on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, um, if you, if you don't, if you're sick of reading, then my, I have a bunch of TED talks on nuclear um, energy. I have written more on weapons. If you just Google my name and weapons, you'll find the articles I've written and various people attacking me to get the response. And then if you want to get my views, I didn't talk much about climate change and why I think it has, to, why nuclear is the only solution to climate mitigation and why renewables aren't, aren't going to do it. But I do have a piece in Quillette called Why Renewables Can't Save the Planet that I would recommend as a good overview of why renewables can't do it and why we need nuclear. Great. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks for coming all the Thanks, way. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I have a couple of quick announcements.